Good morning, and welcome to Faith United Methodist Church. My name is Sandy Ward, and I'm one of Faith's lay worship leaders. Let's begin by reciting our church's mission statement together. Faith United Methodist Church is a church family dedicated to bringing people to Jesus Christ through worship, education, mission, and fellowship. Who is Jesus? What was his mission? And what does it mean to follow him? Today, we continue our journey through the Gospel of John and we'll focus on Jesus' call for his disciples to wash one another's feet. Today's scripture comes from John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 15. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already decided that Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, would betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from supper, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, church, and again, welcome to Faith United Methodist Church. It's so good to see you today. My name is Caleb Hong. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith. Uh, Today, we do continue with our sermon series through the Gospel of John, and every week, we're covering three chapters of the Gospel and then focusing on one part of that larger section. During this series, we're also engaging in our summer Bible reading challenge, This is an invitation for our congregation members to read along, for us to read the scriptures together, three chapters a week, seven weeks, and that'll cover the entire gospel. 
So how many of you stepped up to the challenge and you've read up to or past John chapter 12? Excellent. Excellent. This is excellent. Yeah. And how many of you have at least read one chapter and even started reading the gospel? Yeah, this is actually really good. You're very shy, and you're holding like this, so only I can see you. It's okay, we're in church. You can tell folks you're reading the Bible. That's a good thing, all right? Would uh, encourage everyone, let's read the scriptures together. We are people of the Word. Uh, if you are willing to join the Summer Bible Reading Challenge, I would encourage you to write yes on your blue attendance card, or if you're joining us online, on your connection card, this is, again, just a one-week commitment to read three chapters of the Bible. It'll take about 20 minutes, 15 minutes maybe. You can, you know, update your car insurance, I think, in that same amount of time. It doesn't take long, but it'll bless and deepen your soul. So here's the outline for today's message. I'm going to begin by offering an overview of the reading for this week. John chapter 13, 14, and 15. And then we'll backtrack and I'm going to just have us zero in and focus on Jesus, uh, his example and invitation to serve, and for us to go low. Let's pray. We'll begin. Thank you, Lord, for your word that meets us right where we are. And we're here this day, Lord, from so many different directions, from so many different circumstances, but we're here together before you. So would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are soft and able to receive your word this day? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's start with the overview. John chapter 13, this is the beginning of Jesus' farewell message uh, to his disciples. This is during the Last Supper. As you begin reading this, just recognize that this is a very long conversation. John will cover this farewell address that Jesus has over the next five chapters, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. John opens John uh, chapter 13 with these very beautiful, powerful words. He writes, now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Jesus' public ministry is coming to a close. And as it does, John wants us to focus on the final day before Jesus dies. And in his reflection, John notes that Jesus had this very special and unique love for those who were his own. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus didn't love the whole world. John 3.16 reminds us that Jesus loved the entire world. But John here is talking about a very special and unique love that Jesus had for his disciples, for his own. And it's kind of like you can love all people, but you have that special love for your partner, your spouse, your siblings, your children, grandchildren. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them. We go to verse 2, and we uh, hear why this was especially hard on this particular night. Because John tells us, The devil had put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, to betray Jesus. As a side note, do you ever wonder when you hear about Judas, if he had a choice? Did he have a say, did he have any freedom, the ability to say yes or no on whether or not to betray Jesus? The answer depends on who you ask. Calvinist, reformed theologians would argue, yes, Judas had no choice. He was predestined to carry out God's sovereign plan of betraying Jesus. If you ask a Wesleyan or a Methodist theologian, we would answer no. That even when God or the devil places something on our hearts, we are not mindless robots. We have the freedom to choose, to embrace or resist that temptation. Of course, the bottom line is this. 
Judas did not resist this temptation. Therefore, he becomes that poor, unfortunate soul who is remembered forever as the disciple who betrayed Jesus. The next part of chapter 13 is this fascinating description of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and then his really interesting exchange with Peter, which we'll talk about later. After washing the disciples' feet, Jesus then pr predicts that he's going to be betrayed by one of the twelve. And then when Judas leaves to carry out his plan, Jesus offers the remaining disciples a new commandment. The commandment is to love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus says, if you love one another, when you love one another as I have loved you, then the world will know that you are my disciples. Chapter 13 ends with Jesus predicting that Simon Peter would disown him three times before the night ends. So let's just take a picture, see, uh, kind of step back and see the larger picture of what's happening. I want us to recognize that at this point, at the end of chapter 13, the disciples are dazed and confused, and they are discouraged. This was Jesus' final night with them. This is the night before his death. But instead of a pep talk, Jesus offers a discouraging talk. Instead of building his disciples up, pumping them up, giving them strength, it seems like he starts off by just deflating them. Again, consider what Jesus just said. He's just announced that he's going to die. One of the twelve is a traitor. Peter is going to disown him. Satan's at work against them, and all of them would desert Jesus. Terrible news. It's a good thing this speech covers five chapters, because if he ended in chapter 13, bad end, right? So we go to chapter 14 of John's Gospel, and Jesus, thankfully, <laughs> offers words of hope. And Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. In other words, don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Yes, it's true. I've told you the bad news, and there's going to be hardships and obstacles that you face, but there's good news as well. And in chapter 14, we hear several notes of good news. Here's the first part of the good news from chapter 14. The first part, heaven is real. Heaven is not a figment of our imagination. Heaven is this real place where God dwells and where Jesus will sit at the right hand of the Father. Jesus assures his disciples that, yes, he's going to leave them. Where is he going? He's going to the Father. He's going to prepare a place for them in his Father's house. And then he also promises that he's going to return and take them to be with him so they may be with him for eternity. Thomas responds as only Thomas can, with doubt. <laughs> and it's Thomas who hears this and he asks, or he says, Jesus, we have no idea what you're talking about. We have no idea where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answers with the sixth of his seven I am statements. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice, Jesus doesn't claim to know a way to eternal life some secret handshake or password or code or dance. Instead, Jesus declares that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And I would say this is good news. This is the second part of the good news in this chapter. Jesus is the way to eternal life. Another way to say this, Jesus is the way to God who is the source of life. According to Jesus, the key to eternal life it's not getting a perfect score on the SAT. It's not being six feet tall. It's not running a five-minute mile. How many of you would be in trouble if that were the case? I would be in trouble with all three, right? Eternal life is not something that we accomplish. It's not a popularity contest. It's not based on our achievements or awards. Jesus says the key to eternal life is not a thing. It is a person, and namely, it is himself. He is the way to God. He is the truth about God. And he offers the gift 
of eternal life. Now, Jesus closes John chapter 14 with a third piece of good news for his disciples, and that is the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus promises that even as he leaves, God the Father will send the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the spirit of truth, who will abide in the heart of every believer, reminding us of Jesus' teaching and offering God's gift of peace, even in the midst of the turmoil. So Jesus says this near the end of John chapter 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Move on to John chapter 15. So in John chapter 15, Jesus is acknowledging that this group of disciples that he's talking to will form the nucleus of the church. So in chapter 15, Jesus establishes and he describes the three key relationships that will define the church and help the church carry out its mission. Here's the three that Jesus describes. First, Jesus says the disciples will have a unique relationship with himself. So the first relationship that the church will have that is unique is a unique relationship with Jesus, right? With God. So John chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus declares, I am the true vine. This is the last, by the way, of the seven I am statements. Now, one of the basic truths, (coughs) one of the basic truths about farming is that you cannot uh, produce fruit that is better than the vine. So if you want to bear good fruit, you have to find a good vine. You have to be connected to the right vine. And Jesus, he declares himself to be the true vine. True meaning real, eternal, as opposed to temporary and false. The true vine leads to abundant life. The true vine leads to God. And Jesus says if his disciples are going to bear fruit, They must be connected to him because when we're connected to the true vine, we'll bear fruits. When we're separated or disconnected from the vine, we will bear no fruit. Therefore, Jesus is establishing this is the most important relationship of every Christian in his day, (coughs) excuse me, in his day and today. Doesn't matter how often we come to church doesn't matter how many committees we're serving on. It doesn't matter how many potlucks we attend or how much Bible trivia we have in our heads. Unless we are firmly connected with the true vine, Jesus, we will not bear fruit. We cannot be the women and men God created us to be. So disciples, the church, we have a unique relationship with Jesus. Second, Jesus says, Disciples have a unique relationship with one another in the church. This is verses 12 to 17. Listen to Jesus' words, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. To love one another, it's not optional, it's essential. To love one another, it is not a suggestion, it's a command. For the church to carry out the mission of Jesus Christ, we must love one another just as Christ loved us. What does this look like? It looks like listening to each other, respecting each other, caring for each other, bearing with one another, encouraging one another, picking each other up, even challenging each other. And by the way, this is the gift of friendship, isn't it? For me to be my best as a disciple, I need other disciples to be my friend, to love and invest in me, to learn my name, to notice my gifts, acknowledge my presence, to care about me. And likewise, for you to be your best as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need Christians, not just me, but others, to be your friends to love you, invest in you, learn your name, notice your gifts, laugh with you, cry with you, acknowledge your presence, miss you when you're gone, care about you. Our relationship with one another in the church 
It was never meant to be superficial. Superficial relationships, that is the bane of modern-day Christianity. Jesus never intended for the church to be a spiritual drive through where disciples would stop in for some singing and a 20-minute sermon and leave. Next to having this strong relationship with God, with Jesus, the true vine, Jesus tells us, chapter 15, we have to have this strong friendship, relationship with each other. This is, by the way, where Jesus calls us his friends. Third, Jesus says, the disciples will have a unique relationship with the world, with the world. This is verses 18 to 27. And specifically, Jesus says that his disciples will be hated by the world, just as the world hated him. Now, let's be clear. Jesus isn't trying to scare us. He's not saying that Christians today should expect every other citizen or government to hate us and attack us 24-7. But we need to recognize that Jesus was speaking to his disciples in a very different time and context. Remember? Jesus was speaking to his disciples in a time when it was dangerous. It was literally a life hazard to follow Jesus. Therefore, Jesus says, when we face opposition, obstacles, when the powers of this world oppose the gospel and persecute believers of Jesus, don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Because long before the powers of this world ever opposed us, they opposed, persecuted, and crucified him. That's chapter 13, 14, 15. Let's go back, okay? Rewind and go back to chapter 13. And I want us to consider now what we can learn from foot washing, from Jesus washing his disciples' feet. So this is a passage, uh, again, John chapter 13, starts with verse 1. A mic read for us through 15. It actually goes through 20. This is a, a part of the scripture that goes through verse 20. And Jesus here is describing the kind of person the disciples should be if they're going to represent him. Jesus is saying, what should a disciple look like? I like the summary of this section by a theologian named John Piper who writes this, Christians of high standing should give themselves gladly to lowly service. Christians of high standing, all of us, should give themselves gladly to lowly service. In other words, if God calls us to go high, if God calls us to do something great like being an ambassador of Jesus Christ, like sharing the love of God, then we need to go low. Listen again. This is John's description of Jesus' greatness. John 13, verses 2 and 3. If you would read this with me, actually. The devil had already decided that Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, would betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, and obviously this will continue. But in these few words, John reminds us of Jesus' greatness. It tells us, again, all things were given into his hands by God. What are all things? It's power, honor, glory, wisdom. He had come from God and was returning to God. That means Jesus is God. So with these few words, John declares that Jesus is the greatest human being the world has ever known. He's greater than presidents, greater than kings, greater than pharaohs. Jesus is the goat. You all familiar with goat? Greatest of all time, right? Jesus is the goat of all goats. That's, the establish, that's what he establishes, verses 2 and 3. But then we get to 4 and 5, verse 4 and 5, and we hear how Jesus went low. Verses 4 and 5. He, Jesus, got up from supper, took off his outer robe. He tied a towel around himself. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. 
Here we see Jesus going low, and he does what no one else would do. Jesus goes low, and he does what no one else would do. If you look in the Bible in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible talks about Jesus' humility. And here the Bible tells us that Jesus was one with the eternal God. Jesus lived in glory. He was seated among the heavenly uh, angels on the heavenly throne. He was being served all day long by angels. Can you imagine? That's a really cool scene, right? But out of his love for us, Jesus stepped down from heaven and he came to earth. Creation became, creator became part of creation. The son of God became a son of man. And this is an incredible picture of humility. But of course, Jesus doesn't stop here. So while Jesus is at dinner with his disciples, he takes another step to show the full extent of his love. Jesus, the king of kings, lord of lords, he takes off his robes as a rabbi. He ties a towel around himself. He assumes the position of a slave, and he washes his disciples' feet. Now, in Jesus' day, many of you know, it was customary to greet guests for uh, a host or hostess to greet guests into the home with a kiss on both cheeks and an invitation to wash their feet. But of course, it wasn't going to be the master or host of the house who washed the guest's feet. No! Washing feet was very dirty and stinky. Therefore, this very special job was reserved for the lowest of the low, the lowest servant in the household. Foot washing was humiliating. It was humbling. Nobody embraced it until Jesus. So Jesus and his disciples, they enter into the upper room. No one is in this upper room. No one's present to welcome them, to wash their feet. The disciples weren't going to say anything. This was a gross job. They weren't going to do it. And when Jesus came in, he noticed two things about the disciples. One, their dirty feet. Number two, their proud hearts. He noticed their dirty feet. He also noticed their proud hearts. So this then becomes a teaching moment, a learning experience. Jesus went low, and he did what no one else would do. Notice, Jesus even washed the feet of Judas, the one would who, who would soon betray him. Jesus loved them to the end. Now, personally, it's pictures like this that convince me that the story of Jesus is true. Because no one would conceive this idea of the great big God becoming humble and small, of the creator becoming part of creation, and then embracing the, the ranks of a lowest slave, washing the feet of disciples, even the one who would betray him. Jesus went low, and he did what no one else would do. John chapter 13, verses 12 to 15 he offers, uh, John offers this explanation, has Jesus' uh, explanation of his actions. It says this, verse 12. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one, another, one another's feet. In other words, if I in my greatness go low, do likewise. Verse 15, for I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Jesus' message, very clear. He contradicts the standards and the expectations of the world, and he invites us to do the same. And just as he went low and did what no one else wanted to do, Jesus invites us to do and be the same. Here's another more direct way of saying all this. The people best suited to represent Jesus as his disciples are the lowly, those who are humble, those who are servants, those who are willing to go low in humble service 
to others? Here's the question I think Jesus poses for you and me today. Will this be you? Will this be me? I want to wrap up this message by considering Jesus' really interesting interaction with Peter. And uh, as I start this section, let me ask, how many of you ever, uh, how many of you can associate with Peter? You ever think that you're, you're kind of like Peter? <laughs> yeah, a couple of you like Peter, right? Really interesting. Peter doesn't have an inner voice. He just has an outer voice. He has no filter. Whatever's on his mind, he just has to say. How many of you are like that, right? <laughs> That's Peter, exactly. So, verse 6, John 13, 6. He, Jesus, came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? This is Peter, by the way, being Captain Obvious, right? <laughs> Jesus just washed every other disciple's feet coming up to Peter. Obviously, Peter. Verse 7. Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Now, for many people, this might be the signal to stop talking. When Jesus tells you, you do not know, later you will understand, it's kind of a clue that we should listen more and talk less. But not for Peter, right? When Peter hears this, even when Jesus says this, Peter insists on saying what's on his mind, even when it's totally wrong. You could say he puts his feet into his mouth very often, right? And Peter says to Jesus, let's read this together. What does Peter say? You will never wash my feet. It's not like, Jesus, could you wash my feet later? <laughs> or can I think about this? Or my feet are kind of clean. Maybe I don't need... You will never, ever, never, ever <laughs> wash my feet. I think some of us are like Peter. We like to serve others, but we're too proud to be served ourselves. We like to help others, but we're too proud to confess and express our own need, our own brokenness. Humility is more than just serving someone else. Humility is also recognizing my need, our need to be served. It's recognizing our humanity, our brokenness, that we're not perfect that we're all sinners in need of God's mercy. So look at the next verse. Jesus says to Peter, Unless I wash you, Peter, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. This kind of sinks into Peter. And again, Peter, no filter. What does he say? <laughs> Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He, here's my takeaway from this exchange and it's good news okay if jesus can save a knucklehead like peter he can certainly save a knucklehead like you or me amen furthermore if jesus can use a knucklehead like peter to lead the church and bless others god can certainly use a knucklehead like you or me to lead and serve in the church and bless others amen we don't have to be perfect we don't have to have all the answers. We simply need to trust in God and be humble enough to follow wherever, however, he leads. Today's lesson, very simple. Go and serve. Follow Jesus' example. Go low and do those things that no one else is willing to do. What does that look like in your life? Perhaps this is picking up trash around the church or cigarette butts when you see it in the parking lot. Perhaps this is teaching children or youth or working with infants. Perhaps this is visiting the sick or delivering food to the homebound. In your home, maybe this is taking out the trash or cleaning the bathrooms. Perhaps this is, the mowing, this is mowing not only your lawn, but the lawn of that neighbor who recently went to the hospital. You know, yesterday, we had one of our older members of the church come to worship and uh, as she was leaving the church, uh, she was struggling uh, to walk and stand up straight. We spoke, and she's slowly, you know, making her way to the car. Joe, if you come to Saturday service, you see Joe all the time. 
Joe, our greeter from yesterday, he swoops in and he offers June his arm. And this big smile <laughs> comes on her face, right? Good looking guy, offers his arm. She ha grabs his arm. He walks her all the way to the car. It takes a little while. When he comes back, he looks at me and he says, I was listening. The truth is this. There are always opportunities to serve all around you if you're willing to see it, if you're willing to do it, if you are humble and willing to follow Jesus by going low and doing what no one else will do. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of today and for the gift of your word and for the reminder of how you love us to the end. You love us, Lord, despite our arrogance. You love us despite our confusion. You love us despite our insistence on going our own way. You just love us. And to the end, you show us the extent of your love. So thank you, not only for loving us, but inviting us to be more and more like you. So this day, again, Lord, we offer ourselves to follow you, to trust you, to be your disciples. Would you help us to be the kind of disciples that you call us to be, who are connected with you, who are friends and care for each other, and who will go low in doing what no one else will do. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that strengthens us. Use us to be your instruments of blessing this day and always. In his name we pray. Amen. Now if you would turn to your neighbor with a sign of the heart and say, God loves you and so do I. God loves you so much. God loved you to the end. And in this very, very simple passage, he says, do likewise. Go and do likewise. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. He makes the rules an object of his care. Oh.